So you can tell us that no, we have exercise session. Hmm? So he feels that we have to do this with Juan Jorge and Teresa. So for him to listen to what we're doing, we're going to be present. I'll give you something better to look at. <laughs> All right. It's actually <coughs> the weather here is actually quite cold. <laughs> Okay, I think we are ready to start. All right. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor uh, Sujihara, who is at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, at the Scripps uh, Institute for Oceanography. Uh, Professor Sojiara has given a series of important contributions to uh, dynamical system theory, time series, um, uh, predictability of time series, and more uh, recently about the uh, causal relation between uh, time series. So before uh, we start the lecture. Let me just mention that uh, tomorrow, uh, from tomorrow to Friday, we will have some exercises, kind of uh, computer lab exercises about uh, the, the, the projects uh, of uh, Professor Sujihara. So at the end of the lecture, uh, I will give you some more details of what will be going on during this week. Okay, so. Thank you for being here. So, okay. Um, good af good afternoon. Um, I'm I'm happy to be talking with you today. Uh, this is a first for me. I've never actually delivered a lecture by Skype before. It's nice to be able to see you at the other end. I'm actually going to switch now to um, to slide mode so that um, um, I, I no longer can see you, and I'm not sure if I can hear you at this point. Um, Nathan, do you want to say something to, just to, to test to see if um, I can hear you? Not really. Do is when you start talking, we'll turn off the microphone here so there's no echo. Oh, okay, great. And okay. If we need to interrupt you. We'll just turn. We'll just put the sound back on. But okay, so, sounds good. Okay. So, um, uh, Nathan, were you able to um, uh, distribute um, the yeah, abstract and title and some of those materials. To yeah, so it's all on our web page. So oh, okay, good, good. I'll have access to it. All right. So my my aim here today will be to speak uh, to a particular perspective uh, that may be a special relevance as we move away from uh, simple 20th century century reductionist toy models that are based on fundamental pr principles, so-called uh, physics-based models, to so try to understand how <clears throat> how real real world very messy natural systems behave. You know, for example, while we can easily write down an accurate equation for diffusion of gases in a test tube, modeling oxygen concentrations at depth in a large lake where biology, complex chemistry, and physical currents, et cetera, can intervene is impractical with explicit equations. And the proof of that is that uh, the models that are produced uh, for doing this uh, tend not to predict very well. Um, so um, empirical models, which infer patterns and associations from data, instead of using hypothesized equations, it's inferring these from data, represent an alternative and highly flexible approach. So all this is being made possible by the era, era of uh, big data. Um, and I see 21st century big science as being enabled by a boom in available data. Uh, EDM, uh, the, the approach I'm going to tell you about today, I think is a useful ap approach for this kind of data exploration. The math itself is not especially challenging. However, the, the, the resonance of understanding, sort of the depth of understanding that can be achieved with a, with a better understanding of the 
implications of simple classical assumptions, I mean, obvious things like equilibrium, constancy, and linearity. These are all classic things that are incorporated into most of our models. But understanding the implications of that can be significant. Okay, so um, the two key points of emphasis today in, 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 in well, what I'll talk about today are detecting causation to uncover causal mechanisms in nonlinear dynamic systems. And the second is forecasting as a rigorous way to validate that understanding. All right. Um, we're all familiar with uh, Berkeley's famous dictum, the 1710 um, dictum that was in the treatise for the, on the nature of human knowledge. And um, despite this warning, correlation is really very much at the core of science, both, both in the West and in the East. Um, constructing networks of cause and effect is how we try to understand nature, and it's essentially um, what, what we do in science. And for the most part, and despite the, the uh, Barclay's warning, we use correlation to try to get a grasp on this. An unspoken rule is that correlation is innocent until proven guilty. All right. Thus, distinguishing intuitive correlation from the more subtle and often counterintuitive causation is at the crux, and it's the topic of uh, uh, of this talk, talk today. Um, I'm going to develop, so the talk that I'm going to give is, uh, I, I, I suspect is going to be about an, maybe an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to get about three quarters of the way through, stop and, and ask questions, and then continue on. The last, very last section is going to be about causation, uh, specifically about causation. So I'm going to develop the discussion about um, um, today by, by making a distinction that hinges on these two main elements. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> the, the, the overarching theme is causation, and the very last section is actually gonna get to the degrees of, of how, 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 we, uh, um, um, how, how we investigate this. So uh, the two main elements that I'm gonna use are the fact that uh, nature is dynamic. So um, most of our ideas um, assume that there's an equilibrium and constancy is the rule. And that uh, any dynamics that we see, this is, this is true certainly of uh, lots of environmental models, um, ecological models, fisheries models, so forth. Um, and that um, uh, dynamics that we see are essentially random motion around an equilibrium. So uh, nature is best understood as a movie rather than a snapshot. And second, the fact that nature is nonlinear, meaning that it consists of interdependent parts that are non-separable. Non-separability is a big, big issue here. So context matters. It can't be studied as independent pieces. Rather, um, each piece needs to be studied in the, in the context surrounding it. So let, let's start with a simple example. Um, so consider these two time series. These may be two species, or one may be an environmental index or driver and a physiological sponsor. Uh, it could be interest rates and money supply, whatever. So our working hypothesis based on these observations, um, we consider this like the first decade of, of points that we've observed, the, our working hypothesis is that they are correlated, but how well does this hold up? Here we roll forward another decade or so, so actually 12 years. So except for this small aberration. So, uh, George, are you, we're not seeing your screen. Do you want us to see your screen or not yet? Um, you're, you should have seen the slides, right? You seen the slides? So can you, yeah, you have to do the share view, so we're not. Oh, that's fine. I'm kidding. Hold on. Okay. Uh, so you have to click on share screen. All right. Nothing is nothing happens when I do that. Oh, um, yeah, no, I, I just went through like seven slides. <laughs> I think it would have made what I was saying make more sense. But sorry. So I've clicked on share screen. Okay. Any other suggestions? Uh, so is there something down below that says share video or something like that? I'll try this one. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, now this should work. All right, all right. Now we're there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, let, let me go back to the beginning and I'll just zoom through here. Okay. All right. So yeah. So this was the the first slide where I, I sort of was going on and on about um, um, the uh, 
mm -hmm. the move in uh, the move away from reductionist um, uh, toy models to uh, models that actually allow you to look at real systems and then, and that allow you to to validate your understanding of um, of uh, of these real systems by by being able to predict well. So um, I, mean, I think the main the main motivator here is um, the distinction between you know twenty first uh, twenty uh, twentieth century science, which was really sort of dominated by single factor experiments and uh, idealized systems, idealized you know uh, physics like models that are um, uh, you know, really based on first principles, but that don't apply to more complex situations. And, and I gave you the example of, you know, uh, looking at um, uh, uh, gas diffusion in a test tube. You can write down an equation easily for that, but uh, you can't, you can't, um, uh, it, it's, it's not so practical to try to do this for describing oxygen concentrations in a lake. You know, we have biology, messy biology, messy physics, messy, um, uh, chemistry and so forth um, uh, intervening. Okay, so um, the the two key points um, that I was going that I'm talking about today are detecting causation um, um, to uncover a mechanism, and the second one is uh, using forecasting as a rigorous way to validate understanding. Okay. Um, so th this is <clears throat> so where I started here. Um, science, the Western science is pretty much dominated by um, um, uh, the use of correlation as a, uh, as a means to try to understand things. And, um, oh, hang on a second, what's going on? Hmm. Okay. So an unspoken rule is that correlation is innocent um, until proven guilty. Um, and so distinguishing intuitive correlation from the more subtle and often counterintuitive causation is really at the crux. And it's the uh, topic of the main topic of the talk today. So I'm going to develop a discussion for making this distinction that hinges on these two main elements. First, uh, the fact that nature is dynamic meaning that uh, the temporal sequence actually does matter. Nature is best understood as a movie rather than a snapshot. And second, that um, um, nature is nonlinear. Um, so consider these two time series. These may be two species, one may be an environmental index or driver and a physiological response um, or interest rates of money supply or um, you know, IBM and um, um, Microsoft. Um, okay, so our working hypothesis on these, these observations is that they're correlated with um, how well this is sold out. Um, here we've rolled forward another decade or so, 12 years. And, and except for this, um, this aberration, you can't see my cursor here, except for the aberration right at the beginning, um, um, our hypothesis remains intact. So, you know, we see, we see a pretty good correlation here. But, um, if you roll forward uh, another 20 time steps, and in fact, um, let's see if I can, can, can you see the small, I think we're all right. Okay. So if you roll, roll forward another 20, 20 time steps, um, you find uh, that these two variables are completely uncorrelated. So you, you probably want to turn the, the mic off there because we're getting a lot of, um, okay, that's great. So, um, uh, these, uh, the, that apparent correlation, positive correlation that you saw was actually produced by a uh, simple two species solution difference equation. And if you actually, if you run these the, um, equations far into, um, you know, uh, um, uh, into the future, they, uh, uh, the two variables, although they're deterministically coupled, are actually uncorrelated. So um, the disturbing thing about this is that um, not only does correlation not apply causation, but with simple, really simple nonlinear dynamics, the converse is true. That meaning lack of correlation does not imply lack of causation. So um, this, uh, this seems like it should be an obvious fact, but um, um, it is not. Um, so this converse property is really not well known. Um, and it contradicts a currently held view that correlation 
is a necessary condition for, for causation. Um, this is a, uh, this was actually from Wikipedia taken, I, I believe they've, they've changed this page since I started talking about it, but um, the, um, this was from Wikipedia taken uh, in August or so of last year. Um, so Ed, Ed, Edward Tuft is a, a well-known statistician at Yale, and um, he's saying here that uh, empirically observed covariation is a necessary condition for causality. But we, we saw in that example, that's clearly not true. Okay, so the activity of correlation is supported, I think, by the physiology of how, how we learn. And in fact, one can argue uh, that's almost wired into our co cognitive apparatus. It's um, um, uh, the, the example of heavy and learning, um, the idea that cells that fire together wire together. So I mean, the, the, really the, act, uh, the activity of correlation kind of supports why, we, why, why correlation seems to work uh, so well for our cognitive apparatus. Okay. So that's the picture that emerges is not only does correlation not imply causation, but um, um, non, uh, in nonlinear systems, you'll find causal um, connections that are invisible to correlation. So the light blue crescent. Um, this is interesting because um, um, within this realm, um, um, for the consequence of nonlinearity demonstrated in the model example was this phenomenon of mirage correlation. So um, these, these ephemeral or mirage correlations are associations that, that, uh, that come and go and even switch sign. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of the perverse tendencies of nonlinear systems and, and really the bane of financial modeling. So relationships that appear then disappear as soon as you try to exploit them. <coughs> Let's see an example. Um, this is a, an example not from finance, but uh, from ecology. Uh, it was a study by John McGowan, and it was an attempt to explain red tides occurring at the Scripps Pier. So these green spikes that you see um, uh, are chlorophyll blooms that actually correspond to red tides, the appearance of red tides. And um, it's an extremely conspicuous uh, feature here at Scripps that uh, people have been trying to explain for a, a century, basically. Um, what McGowan found is uh, there was a positive correlation between these red tides and um, uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly, which basically was an indication of stratification, water stratification. So um, they were about to publish this, but were a little slow. And if you roll forward, you can see that the positive correlation actually flips to a negative correlation. Um, uh, they they lost a little bit. They lost their funding between 2001 and 2004. So that's the gap. Uh, and then uh, you can see there's absolutely no correlation um, since then. So um, here's another example from Southern California. Using data up to 1991, there's a significant positive relationship between uh, sea surface temperatures here on the x-axis and sardine production measured in two different ways, uh, the, the, the y-axis. So these are just different ways of measuring productivity of sardines. And um, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, temperature um, relationship was then used to, to uh, create a, a law in California that below 17, um, 17 degrees, the harvests had to be low, and above 17, they were, they were um, uh, um, designated to be higher. And, um, but if you take these same data, so I'm not removing these data. What I'm all, all I'm doing is adding uh, to them um, data going up to 2008. Um, so I have the data up to 1991, and I'm just adding the data up to 2008. You see that the correlation go, goes away. So the, the, this plan was actually suspended then in 2010, which is where it now stands. Um, another famous example. This is from again from Fisheries. Uh, was a meta-analysis of um, 74 environment. Uh, productivity relations or environment recruitment um, relations that were reported in the literature. And when these were retested with subsequent data, data subsequent to their publication, only 28 out of the 74 were held to retest. So um, what's, uh, what's interesting is that uh, among the 28 that held to retest, so this was done in 1998, uh, was sardines. So sardines, in fact, we know um, would, uh, are less. And my guess is that if you did this now, so this was done in 1998, if you did this now, 20 years later, you, you, you might find um, uh, that none of these um, will hold to be test. All right, so um, how do we address this? The, uh, the approach that I'm gonna present here is based on nonlinear state space reconstruction, which um, 
um, I'm referring to with the less technical name, empirical dynamics. Bio, bio, so this, <coughs> this work was originally intended for, for biologists who, who um, um, are scientists who actually don't like mathematics. And, and um, so um, a name like um, nonlinear state space reconstruction um, is kind of off-putting to, to, to um, most of my colleagues. Whereas a name like empirical dynamics is, is a little friendlier. So that's, that's the term that we're using right now. Um, uh, EDM is a, a holistic data-driven approach for studying complex systems from their attractors. And it's designed to address nonlinear issues such as uh, mirage correlation, the one that we just saw. Um, I'm, I'm now gonna play a brief video animation that, that will uh, explain everything. This, is, this video was actually made by, by my son when he was a junior, um, he was a uh, math major actually at Col Columbia. And the narration is by uh, Robert May, um, who's my, who is my former advisor. Here we go. This animation illustrates the Lorentz attractor. The Lorentz is an example of a coupled dynamic system consisting of three differential equations where each component depends on the state and dynamics of the other two components. You can think of each component, for example, as being species foxes, rabbits, grasses, and each one changes depending on the state of the other two. So these components shown here as the axes are actually the state variables or the Cartesian coordinates that form the state space. Notice that when the system is in one lobe, X and Z are positively correlated, and when the system is in the other lobe, X and Z are negatively correlated, the other wing of the butterfly. We can view a time series thus as a projection from that manifold onto a coordinate axis of the state space. Here we see the projection onto axis X and the resulting time series recording displacements of X. This can be repeated on the other coordinate axes to generate other simultaneous time series. So these time series are really just projections of the manifold dynamics onto coordinate axes. Conversely, we can recreate the manifold by projecting the individual time series back into the state space to create the flow. In this panel, we can see the three time series, X, Y, and Z, each of which is really a projection of the motion on that manifold. And what we're doing is the opposite here. We are taking the time series and projecting them back into the original three-dimensional state space to recreate the manifold. A butterfly attractor. Okay, so <clears throat> the main insight from that video is to understand that a time series is a projection or observation uh, uh, or a, uh, observation of motion on an attractor. So the, the jargon term uh, for a time series is, is an observation function. It's an observation, time series is an observation uh, of the uh, function of the dynamics on the attractor. So conversely, we can reconstruct an attractor obviously simply by replotting the relevant time series data. So construct and constructing attractors from time series data is really kind of the, the basis of the empirical dynamic approach. Um, all right, what's important to understand is that the attractor and the equations are really equivalent. Um, the both contain pretty much identical information. They, and both represent the rules governing the relationships among variables. Um, and depending on when they're viewed, these relationships can appear to change, giving rise to mirage correlations. So on the left, um, uh, X and Z are in, in, in the right-hand lobe, uh, X and Z are positively correlated, and when in the, in the left-hand lobe, X and Z are negatively correlated. So that, this is kind of a geometric picture of uh, uh, of why you might see mirage correlations sometimes. So um, again, over the short term, you're gonna see these correlations, you know, positive correlated, negatively correlated. But in the long term, if you actually plotted out, you know, values for X and Z and you spart and you sampled sparsely with a little bit of noise, you see absolutely no, no, no relationship between them at all. That, that this is kind of a, a trivial, simple example of, of um, ca a causal relationship between variables that would not be uh, visible with correlation. So let's look at, uh, at a real example. Um, this is an application <clears throat> that um, I was initially skeptical about, uh, uh, skeptical about, mainly because I couldn't see how to get time series 
Um, I mean, when you're uh, when you're sampling a cell and trying to uh, uh, um, you know uh, measure its genome, you you naturally kill the cell. Um, and, but uh, Inder uh, Inder Verma figured out uh, some really interesting way of doing this. Um, Inder is uh, the American Cancer Society professor, professor at, uh, at Salt, and um, uh, uh, he he ha he has been uh, editor in chief of PNAS, a very sort of influential guy, very interest and very interested in um, uh, these general methods of detecting causation, and also in the um, the potential insights that can be gained by looking at gene expression as a dynamic process. So. Um, these, these are experimental data that were actually obtained uh, by Gerald Pau, who's a researcher in, in Inder's lab, um, on expression levels of transcription uh, factor SWE4 and the cyclin uh, CLIN3 yeast. So this is yeast expression, and we're simultaneously measuring levels of, of, these, two, um, uh, of these two variables. So viewed statically, obviously, there's no, no relationship. There's no cross-correlation. Um, However, when the measurements are connected by time, they are they're clearly interrelated. So we see the, the skeleton of an attractor emerging here. Um, obviously, when there's no time, time ordering, um, you know, the structure disappears, the tangled mess with paths crossing. So what's interesting here is that um, even in the two dimensions, um, uh, the, you, you get trajectory co uh, crossings. In other words, singularities, um, indeterminate uh, um, uh, points of indeterminacy where you can either go right, left, up, or down. However, these disappear um, when you, these crossings or singularities disappear when you include uh, a third dimension. This is uh, uh, information about the cycling, um, uh, um, let's see what, what do we have here. We, we're going to use a CLIB2, CLIB2. All right. So um, if there are, are rules governing a system, um, there's going to be an attractor, right? So in my experience, most of the data sets I've looked at, and really for a wide range of pro problems, you know, from geophysics problems to biological problems to, uh, to ecological problems to, um, in this case, uh, um, gene expression, uh, all show, show evidence of, of there being attractors. I mean, it makes sense because the attractor is really showing how, in this case, for example, how these three variables relate to each other through time. So it, it, it contains really, really important mechanistic information um, about the system. So I'm going to play you one more, uh, actually, I'm going to play you another short video right here that explains a key result for um, EDM uh, related to connectivity and information sharing. And, and again, this is um, uh, narrated by Robert May. There's a very powerful theorem proven by Floris Tartans that shows generically that one can reconstruct a shadow version of the original manifold simply by looking at one of its time series projections. For example, consider the three time series shown here. These are all copies of each other. They are all copies of variable legs. Each is displaced by an amount tau. So the top one is unlagged, the second one is lagged by tau, and the blue one at the bottom is lagged by two tau. Tarkin's theorem then says that we should be able to use these three time series as new coordinates and reconstruct a shadow version of the original butterfly manifold. This is the reconstructed manifold produced from lags of a single variable, and you can see that it actually does look fairly similar to the butterfly attractor. Each point in the three-dimensional reconstruction can be thought of as a time segment with different points capturing different segments of history of variable x. This method represents a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold, the butterfly attractor, and the reconstruction, allowing us to recover states of the original dynamic system by using lags of just a single time series. So, so to, to recap, um, Taken's theorem says basically that any one variable contains information about the others, which is interesting. So this, this allows construction of attractors from single variables using lags as proxy coordinates. So if you're dealing with a system that's basically like a black box and you're trying to understand what's going on, but you have one observation function, you should be able to get some information about that black box, basically turning it into a gray box by observing one time series variable 
and doing these sort of lagged coordinate reconstruction. It'll tell you something about um, the number of embedding dimensions that are required, so something about the complexity of the process. And you know, more, most importantly, it'll tell you whether this black box is really just a stochastic thing or whether there, there's any determinism in it. So um, the, the, the basic idea is that uh, we're constructing attractors from time series data. And uh, this can be done either univariately using Taken's theorem, multivariately as we did in the very first genetics example, or we can actually <coughs> create these mixed embeddings uh, 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 combining both, uh, uh, both modes. So let's look at some examples. Okay. Again, this is an example of using lags with the expression time series. Um, uh, from, these are from production of uh, insulin-like growth factor binding protein from, from mouse fibroblast cells uh, to construct a, a shadow manifold. So here, um, uh, you know, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not following all of, the, um, all, all of the gene products. I'm just following this one. And so I just have one time series. And I'm taking lags of this one time series to see if there's any determinants. So the way that this is, this is done is uh, you have a, a, a big Petri dish with little, maybe, maybe with 10,000 different samples in it and, uh, of, cell, of individual cells, and you shock them to synchronize them. And then you can sample um, so that the Petri dish, in effect, has, is, is like one big synchronized cell. And then you, um, um, then you, can, you can sample them um, in, in order to get a time series. So clearly, gene expression is a, is a, um, is a dynamic process. All right, so this is, this is a simple ecological example. These are uh, uh, attractors constructed using lag coordinates again uh, for sock, sockeye salmon returns in Canada. Um, so each point here represents a three-year history, and basically the trajectory is run along consecutive three-year histories. So there's nothing special about representing anything in three dimensions, or three dimensions always coming up as important. I've only chosen, I, I have systematically chosen examples that I can show in three dimensions so that they're easy to represent um, here. So, um, so the, the fact that three dimensions is sufficient to unfold the trajectories <coughs> excuse me, suggests that it may be possible to make a reasonable um, three-factor multivariate model with well-chosen mechanistically relevant time series. So for example, river discharge, sea surface temperature, and spotting stock biomass, perhaps. All right. So one of the most compelling features, uh, I think, of EDM is uh, that it can be used to forecast um, and to do this successfully in systems that appear random. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a very sort of uh, um, se seductive um, capability of EDM uh, that, that, that um, uh, was actually the, uh, the thing that originally convinced me that the approach was worth looking into and it, and it led me into, into finance uh, fairly early in my, in my career. I, I don't know if um, uh, Nathan or if anyone had, had mentioned, but um, I spent some, some um, um, six years away from academia I, uh, um, on a leave of absence, basically. I think it's the longest leave of absence in the University of California history, um, uh, working as a managing director for Deutsche Bank, uh, doing proprietary trading with some of these methods. So um, they were, they had, um, uh, uh, been managing on the order of $2 billion every day um, in, notion, in daily notional risk. It was interesting. All right. Um, uh, I just want to make one point before we get into this, and, and that's that out of sample forecasting um, should be the rigorous way that uh, the rigorous method we use to validate our understanding. And, and there is some confusion in, in the literature about the difference between fitting and prediction. Um, and it seems odd that this is, this is true, but um, I want to show you one, one example um, that demonstrates it. Um, this, is, um, this article appeared in Science a while back, provides, a, 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 I think, a pretty interesting case. Um, what they're trying to do is uh, forecast um, a river discharge of the Oklahoma River. So the Oklahoma River is a major tributary to the Mississippi. And um, between 1993 and 2002, um, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars had been spent um, on um, uh, uh, improving monitoring, uh, uh, creating a large, very complicated supercomputer model, and so forth, um, that uh, I think everyone was hoping would lead to, to better predictions. And um, these are all, again, they were models here. They're large kind of physics-based models that had uh, modules that were, uh, you know, 
based on well-known uh, 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 physical equations. But um, the bottom line is, uh, so the lower, the, the lower line shows the one day ahead forecasts, and the, uh, the red line up above shows the error in the three day ahead forecasts. And, and what you see is that the, um, th there is no apparent, um, you, know, you know, although we spent a huge amount of money between 93 and 2002, our ability to forecast really hasn't improved. And in fact, maybe, maybe it's gotten a little bit worse. So um, the dashed lines, uh, quite embarrassingly, is what you would get if you say to tomorrow's uh, discharge is going to be the same as today. So the dashed line is what we call the constant prediction. So um, again, I, I really do think uh, uh, this kind, so this kind of audit is rare in science. And in, in fact, um, out of sample prediction is, is rarely used as a validation in science. I mean, it's quite easy to publish a lot of papers, but uh, for, for, for the work to actually not, not, not show good predictions. So um, predictability is certainly a measure of merit in financial engineering where the, the stakes are high and the accountability is, is immediate. So track records are really important. The, the, the kind of result you see here is, is, is pretty rare. The fact that they've kind of gone back and audited our are we actually getting our money's worth and finding that um, you know maybe this is not uh, uh, maybe we're, we're, we're not doing we're not doing this correctly okay so um, the two um, I'm going to look at two basic methods um, simplex projection and, and s maps uh, many other possibilities exist uh, these are just two very simple simple ones so um, um, simplex projection and s maps are basically um, two different ways of um, doing function, function approximation. Uh, so the first one is simplex projection, which is really a zeroth order nonlinear prediction method. And so to predict um, xt plus one, we look at um, point xt on the manifold or on the attractor, find its nearest neighbors, and then see where those nearest neighbors went and we take a weighted average. So, I mean, the basic idea is, is you know, how, how do you predict the future? You do it by looking at similar points in the past and see where they went. But, but the key is having the right dimensionality, and you'll, you'll see why this is key. So, um, again, um, each point um, on, on the attractor is a, is a history vector um, or a history fragment. And we look at um, nearest neighbors, um, so points that have similar histories, basically, not just similar current values, but sim similar histories. Um, and then we project them forward to see where they went. Um, and then we take the center of mass, and that's our, our weighted center of mass, and that's our, our prediction. And it's a, it's a really simple idea that, that works um, remar remarkably well. So <clears throat> this is a white noise uh, time series, uh, you know, statistically not predictable. <laughs> what we're going to do is just take the first half of this data and, and see what we get if we embed that first half um, with time mod coordinates. And what I'm going to show you again, this is three, there's nothing magic about three here, but I, I'm going to show you what happens if you, if you take essentially like a fork with three prongs and lay it down on the time series and drag it across and, and plot, those, plot those values. So uh, this is what you get. So this is, we're looking at um, x of t, x of t minus tau, x of t minus two tau. And uh, we get uh, out of that mess, we, we get something that looks fairly, fairly coherent. And now if we use this um, in that same kind of nearest neighbors recipe to see um, how well we do next, um, this is the, the result. Again, this is actually predicting two time steps ahead, which is, which is more difficult because this is a chaotic system and you're, uh, you're getting exponential divergence of trajectory. But so um, if I showed the one time step uh, plot, it would look on, and in, uninteresting because all, all the all the dots basically fall on the line and you can't see anything. So this is predicting ahead two time steps. And you can see, uh, again, we're looking at, uh, at predicted versus the observed values. And you can see that, that this, uh, uh, this worked out pretty well. So in, in this case, um, how, did, um, how did I choose the three dimensions to embed this? So um, the, the way that you choose it is to use predictability. Uh, basically, you, you want to the best embedding is the embedding that unfolds the, the, the singularities, the best, best resolves the singularities, the best unfolds the attractor. So um, you, in this case, I'm showing you what rho would be a prediction skill or the correlation coefficient between predicted and observed. And if I go, if, if, you, if you look, you see that there's a peak with an embedding dimension of around three. 
And um, that, um, uh, again, just basically means that I've resolved the singularities best in that particular case for those data using three dimensions. Um, so this is, this is uh, based on uh, Whitney's embedding theorem. So if you, if you have a, suppose your, your attractor looks like a ball of thread. And, and if you now try to embed that ball of thread in, in one dimension, that would be like um, um, uh, uh, looking at the image, just shining a light above the ball of thread um, over a line and looking at the shadow on the line. So at any point on that line, I could go right or left with equal, equal likelihood. So there's singularities everywhere. If I now try to embed that ball, ball of thread, so my, uh, my attractor this ball of thread, in two dimensions, it's like shining a light on top of this ball of thread and looking at the disk, sh the shadow of the disk. And um, uh, so at every point on that disk, there are singularities. They can go up, down, right, or left. But if I now embed this ball of thread in three dimensions, I see, oh, uh, you know, in fact, uh, um, I see the, the, the individual trajectories, the, 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 the twine. So um, I've now re resolved all these singularities. Um, so again, this makes sense, uh, thinking of the, 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 the thread is one dimensional, so 2D plus one, I can embed it, in, I can always embed it in three. All right. So again, predictability is a, is a good, is a test um, to see, um, what, uh, is a test um, to find um, an, uh, um, a reasonable embedding dimension. So <clears throat> the, the next um, uh, 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 method is above first order, above zeroth order is first order, and here we're, we're essentially taking a, a weighted autoregressive prediction method um, computed over points on, on, on the attractor. So um, the, uh, the model parameter, we have this model parameter theta that controls weighting that's applied to points uh, in, in global versus local state space. Um, if theta is equal to zero, all the attractor points are weighted equally. And so it's, uh, a linear model that we're fitting uh, through all of that data is um, you know, just a hyperplane. And we have, a, you know, it's a flat manifold, there's no state dependent, doesn't matter where you are in state space, you, the, the coefficients are constant. Um, as you increase theta, um, the local points get weighted uh, more heavily, and, and, and that would be evidence for, for a, for a nonlinear model. <clears throat> this will all be clear, clearer in a second. Okay, so, um, so I probably could have made this a little bit more, um, I probably could have made this a little more technically explicit, but um, um, okay, oh well. All right, so the <clears throat> I, I don't normally get to, to speak to a mathematically literate audience, so this is you know this is a, uh, this is unusual right now. Uh, okay, so if the S map has a theta of zero, all I'm doing is computing the the, the global um, autoregressive model. So uh, essentially, what you do is you, you construct a Jacobian um, uh, that goes across um, the entire um, uh, attractor, and uh, you end up with these fixed coefficients that then can be used in an AR model. So all points get weighted equally in how you compute this thing. And, and normally, one would use singular value decomposition to, to make this computation. All right. So if you, on the other hand, you, um, <clears throat> you weight points. So if there is an attractor and you weight the points below it more heavily, um, then um, uh, where you compute this Jacobian depends on where you are on the attractor. So those coefficients are not fixed for all points in time, but they vary depending on where you are on the attractor. Okay. If you crank up theta, of course, you're gonna be using more and more local values. So again, once you, once you crank up theta, you have to think about recomputing the Jacobian for every point on the attractor. So the relationships among variables change depending on where you are on the attractor. All right. And if you do this, and you actually find that um, as you crank up theta, your predictability, which is measured by rho, the Pearson correlation coefficient, improves, then you know that there's curvature. Then you know that the best description is not a simple global linear map, but the best description is one that acknowledges where you are in state space. And so it turns out that if you do this on a, on a lot of different data, um, um, that um, almost, uh, that, that it's, the curvature is very common. 
So uh, this is, uh, these are data um, uh, on the top uh, for um, uh, North Pacific biological time series. So various, you know, diatoms, fish data, et cetera. And if you do this sort of a test, you find that <clears throat> all of them are, are nonlinear. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples of this uh, uh, from other fisheries, from sheep, from diatoms, from cardiac rhythms, sunspots, gravitational flux, poop fly behavior, neural, I mean, they're, they're, it's just everywhere. If you do this test, um, you, you find that it's, that it's very ubiquitous. All right. uh, okay. So um, uh, this paper, um, that appeared last year in the proceedings of the, the Royal Society uh, B used, um, used S maps to show how species interactions vary in time, depending on where on the attractor you are. So again, um, what, you're, what you're doing here is essentially um, uh, using S maps, this, uh, this simple method, to uh, recompute the Jacobian at each, as, the, as you travel at each point as you travel along the attractor. So um, if th this is a way of making real-time measurements of interactions that are, that are state dependent, uh, which, is, which is very um, um, uh, much at odds with uh, what's done classically in ecology where it's assumed that you have a single equilibrium point. And if you, do a, if you, if you, if you look at the behavior of the system at that equilibrium point, then uh, uh, all you need to do is compute the, the Jacobian at that point. It's like, you know, the standard linear, um, uh, local linear stability analysis. And um, uh, that, um, uh, that, particular, that particular way of looking at systems um, is essentially making the assumption that the interactions are going to be constant, regardless of, of where you are in the system or regardless of, of, uh, of, of when you view it. Okay. So, um, uh, so the basic idea again is that um, the the S map involves ca calculating a hyperplane of surface at each point as the system travels along its attractor. So this um, involves calculating the Jacobian matrix, whose elements are the partial derivatives that measure the effect of the system variables on each other. So note that um, the embeddings here are multivariate, meaning they're they're native coordinates; they're not just using lags. Um, again, the coefficients are fit sequentially for each location on the manifold using weighted linear regression, with the strongest weight given the points nearby um, on the track. So, in a stable equilibrium system, again, these points are fit to uh, uh, are fit in a, in a, uh, at a single equilibrium point and are fixed and unchanging. So, but in S maps, these values are state dependent; they vary depending on the location on the track. So, I, I realize I've repeated myself about three times here, but uh, I just want to make sure that the, the point gets across. Uh, we're, we're computing these sequential Jacobians in, in order to track how the, how the interactions, which are, which are essentially summarized in these uh, uh, Jacobian elements, um, how these uh, uh, elements change as, with the evolving system state. Okay, so what's interesting here is we're actually applying this not to a model, but to real data. So these are, these are data that were taken from um, a marine mesocosm experiment. They essentially took a section of the ocean, you know, uh, demarcated a, a plastic barrier and measured, measured things and tracked things inside. So the, uh, what's, what's interesting here is that if you, if you look at um, competition, so this negative interaction between the two main grazers um, shown in red, um, these are the two, the two zooplankters are um, talonoid copepods and rotifers. The competition really waxes and wanes. So, I mean, our normal conception of competition is that you have, you know, two things sort of competing with each other in some averaged way, and we write these equations down that, that basically assume that that average is constant through time. But what, what we see here in, in, in the data is that competition is really, really very episodic, and, and uh, that all of these interactions are varying considerably in time. So, you know, a lot of the time, there's no interaction, there's no competitive interaction between these copepods and rotifers at all. So most of the time, we're kind of flat near, near zero. But occasionally, we get these big spikes where the interaction is strong. I mean, this, this, is, this is a kind of a, a, 
an interesting view of nature as as really being governed by these by, the, by these very strong episodes as opposed to being you know sensibly being thought of as, as um, um, time uh, interactions that are time average. This is, this, is, this, is, this is reality, this is actual data, show, uh, what actual data are showing us. So <clears throat> the fact that competition occurs only occasionally um, uh, uh, raises the question, um, why does that happen? So what is it about the system? What is the characteristic of the system state for an example? And um, if, you, if you look at the data, you find that competition is very state dependent. That, um, so here we're looking at food abundance versus the strength of competition. This is the absolute value of competition here, or, or actually the minus so competition. All right, so you can see that when food is very abundant, there's absolutely no competition. So most of the time, food is, is, a, is sufficiently abundant that these, these things are not interacting in any competitive way. But every once in a while, there are these bottlenecks where food becomes scarce. And it's during those bottlenecks um, so uh, around zero in food abundance, when competition becomes very strong. So, um, but um, clearly that's not the whole story. Um, food scarcity seems to be a necessary, but it's certainly not a sufficient condition for there being strong competition. So it's not the whole story, but we're, we're at least getting uh, a piece of it here. So this is an example of actually getting a mechanistic insight using EDM and of, of uh, developing a qu a quite a different view of how nature is structured um, using EDM. All right. So um, I could go on to causality right now, but I'm thinking that maybe we should pause right now. And um, I could take any questions, uh, or maybe we could take a little break, and, uh, and then I can move on to causality. So um, Nathan, you could turn on the mic. And, and okay. I, I Anybody have questions? Hi, I I'm, I wonder where, whether how did you calculate the correlation in the in the in the gene expression in the in the yes uh, that time varying correlation how how was it calculated in order to get that high correlation when they get up and down in different ways. So the 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 what what you can do with the with the yeast example. So if you look at, at two variables, let's see. Let me go back. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me find the slide. Yeah, so if you look at the, the two variables, um, SWE4 and CLIN3, um, they appear to be uncorrelated using the Pearson correlation coefficient. Okay, but, and now you're asking, are they, are they related? And one way to look at whether they're related is, in, and in this case, I'm getting singularities between CLIN3 and SWE4, lots of crossings. But I find that if I include um, CLIB2, that those singularities get resolved. So what does that mean? That means that, that so, so before I was looking, uh, looking at the panel here on the far left, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, far left, there's no, there's no Pearson correlation between these two things. They appear to be unrelated. However, if you, if you now look at the attractor um, in three dimensions and, and you try to make predictions about where, what the values of any one of these things is going to be next, you, uh, you, your predictions are going to be very good. Okay. That was so the prediction between observed versus predicted. So what we're finding is that, that there is, in fact, um, a way of, of, of finding a coherent structure here that you couldn't find if you looked at, at the thing statistically. Okay, so we would use, so here we're, we're saying that, you know, you can't really predict CLIN3 from SWE4 here in, in looking at the far left panel. However, if you, if you look at this thing as a dynamic system, you can actually predict 
um, a CLIN3 from SWE4. In fact, you, should be, you can predict all of these variables from each of the other variables. Okay, so um, that's, that, 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 um, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. If there's any, any other question, I, I would like to ask you a, a small question is, how do you character, characterize the topology of, of those S, S maps? Because so, it's, yeah. It's, that yeah. were similar, but how, how can you say it's similar and in higher dimensions it's impossible to see it by eye? But. Yeah, yeah. So the, the S map is, is really just a, um, uh, a, linear, um, a linear map. It's first order. And, and um, you know, it's, uh, the coefficients are obtained by looking at a row in the Jacobian matrix for the, for the auto, making predictions using the S map. In the other regressive model. So the topology is flat. It's a you know if you, if you have high 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 number of dimensions, if you have you know ten uh, if you're embedding in ten dimensions, then you have a yeah an AR ten, and uh, you know that's a that's a, a you, you've created a when you generate the Jacobian, you're looking at an n dimensional uh, at a ten dimensional hyperplane. So it's linear. It's linear. It's really uh, part of Part of my philosophy in doing all of this is to try to keep things as simple as possible and, and with as few uh, knobs and tunable parameters as possible. And, and this comes partly from, from the fine, working on the finance problem where um, uh, we desperately want to try to find something that actually works. And so it's quite easy, we're, we're clever, right? And so we, it's quite easy, we, it's, we can fool ourselves easily into thinking that you know, these ink blots are actually an interesting pattern. And so <clears throat> if you're restricted though to a, to a model, to an exploratory model that does not have many free parameters. So for example, if you do you use simplex to say whether this data is deterministic, whether there's any uh, determinism in this data, then I really only have one, you know, uh, assuming that, assuming that, so in, in ecology, um, uh, oversampling is never a problem. So we rarely have data that are oversampled. And so in ecology, the default tau or the, the default lag, if you're looking univariately, would be one. So um, that means that there's really only one free parameter, which is the embedding dimension. So if you can generate a model that's essentially a one parameter model that predicts data that looks unpredictable well, then um, uh, that, that's, to me, that's fairly strong evidence that that the um, uh, that uh, the data actually um, is has this deterministic structure, and that you're able to capture that by by taking a lag coordinate embedding. So again, if, if you can actually make good predictions with a, essentially a one parameter model, making fitting one parameter, then then um, uh, you're more likely to be um, uh, you're less likely to be misleading yourself into thinking that, uh, that there's a pattern there when there isn't. So um, in, in simplex, I mean, for example, there are lots of variations on nearest neighbor forecasting. And what's, what's interesting about simplex is that, you know, for one of, the, one, of the, one of the obvious parameters that you might vary would be the number of neighbors. So simplex fixes the number of neighbors at E plus one. So E plus one would be the number of points so that a, a point that you're trying to predict is an interior point of the simplex. Right, so by fixing e plus one, I've taken that out as a um, as a possible tunable parameter. So what I want to do is, is to like create models that um, that basically don't allow me to fool myself. That are simple, and um, uh, uh, extract the pattern in the in a way that it, that sort of has the fewest possible fewest possible assumptions. Uh, hello, Sujara. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a simple question. Um, if you uh, if you apply this method of CCM analysis, but uh, with a system that is not closed, so you have different variables entry and leave in the system, so the the coupling uh, parameter changes over time. What would happen to this analysis? That's a that, that's a great that's a great question. 
So, um, and I'm, I'm actually going to show you, before I answer it um, uh, very thoroughly, um, um, in the, so following the discussion of causality, I'll show you some examples. And I'll give you an example, actually, of, and, and this is one involving uh, forecasting red tides here at Scripps Pier. So, um, here. So it's an example of trying to forecast um, out there, just outside of my office. Um, so that, that, um, uh, it turns out that, that you can combine, you can think of these external driver. It, it may be, so essentially what you're trying to do is um, um, uh, come up with some, some sort of reasonable operational procedure that um, allows you to, to, to better understand how the system is working. And um, uh, the, the way that that is, the, the way that these external drivers would be handled is to think of them essentially as external drivers or stochastic drivers. And it may be possible to use the causality technique to identify what they are, even though they're not part of the system, even though they're, they're external to the system. So um, um, it, it may be, and again, what the way that you, your view of the system is constrained by the data that you can obtain, the, 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 is basically constrained by your, uh, the, the potential for your observations on that system. So if, 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 your, if your data are, if you, if you can only view the system over some small period of time, then um, you're going to get a view of the system that really reflects the, uh, whatever the, uh, the particular characteristic that, that's in play during that small period of time. So you, you can imagine a system where in different periods of time, there may be different external drivers. And um, so if you're viewing a system at a particular period of time and you, uh, and you identify a certain set of external drivers, that's good information. And then if you're able to continue to view that system longer and you find, oh, these drivers seem to be changing, then that's something that you should be able to detect, that you should be able to measure. And that's, again, very good information. So it could be that in the, in, if you think very globally, that you know, flipping between these two different external drivers, if you looked at it over infinite time, that there's dynamics behind how these external drivers come in and come out. And so then that would allow you to, to think of that, what was, what was then an external driver as an internal driver, right? So it's, this is a very pragmatic thing. I'm, uh, you're basically constrained by the reality of your observations. Okay. Uh, are there more questions? Any other? So I think um, um, I'm going to I'm going to go on to the to the next section, which is causality. Let me move the slides forward a little bit. Hold on. So let's uh, let's take a look at and, and see how and I, and I think this is going to give you um, so the, the those comments that I just made um, I think will be will be illustrated and maybe become clearer in this section so let, let, let's let's um, uh, see how EDM deals with causation <coughs> excuse me okay so here here um, uh, the the current sort of industry standard for for measuring causation is um, Granger causality. And Clive Granger was actually a professor here in the economics department who, who won a Nobel Prize for this idea. It was about a Nobel Prize in economics, which some people think is not a real Nobel Prize, but it impresses me. Um, anyhow, um, what, what, uh, what Granger causality says is that um, here, say looking on the left side, if the, the variance in your prediction, and you're trying to predict Y2, Given the universe of all possible va variables, which is uh, hat u, given the universe of all pos given the universe of all possible variables, I'm trying to predict y two. I end up with a certain variance that's 
less than, now I'm looking at the right-hand side of that inequality, the variance that you would get if, again, you're trying to predict y2, but now you remove y1 from the universe of all possible variables. Okay, so it says Granger causality, this is the formal de definition, the formal statement of Granger causality, is that if you remove y1 from the universe of all possible variables, and your predictions of y2 de diminish, then y1 Granger causes y2. Okay. So the, the problem, however, is that for dynamic systems, you really can't remove y1. And in fact, Granger, Granger published this in 1968. And in, in that paper, he said, quote unquote, this may not work in dynamic systems. So um, according to Takens, information about each variable is encoded in, in the others. And so the, the idea of removing y1 is not, um, um, is you know, potentially not, not, not possible because you can always recover y1 from some of the other variables. All right, so um, we have this new definition, this alternative def definition, is that time, time series variables are causally related if they are coupled. And in, in particular, if perturbing one variable perturbs the other. And that's the key. What's in parentheses is actually the key. Okay, so if x causes y, then information about x must be encoded in the shadow manifold of y. Um, so uh, information about the, the causal variable is found within, uh, within the victim, as it were. Information about the aggressor is found within the victim. Okay, so, and this is something that can be tested with cross mapping. So the, the basic idea was, was described in this article, which is um, in, in the readings. And um, it's summarized in this, this uh, final video clip. Taken's theorem gives us a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold and reconstructed shadow manifolds. Here, we will explain how this important aspect of attractor reconstruction can be used to determine if two time series variables belong to the same dynamic system and are thus causally related. This particular reconstruction is based on lags of variable x. If we now do the same for variable y, we find something similar. Here, we see the original manifold m as well as the shadow manifolds mx and my created from lags of x and y respectively. Because both mx and my map one-to-one -to, -one to the original manifold m, they also map one-to-one -to, -one to each other. This implies that the points that are nearby on the manifold my correspond to points that are also nearby on mx. We can demonstrate this principle by finding the nearest neighbors in my and using their time indices to find the corresponding points in mx. These points will be nearest neighbors on MX only if X and Y are causally related. Thus, we can use nearby points on MY to identify nearby points on MX. This allows us to use the historical record of Y to estimate the states of X and vice versa, a technique we call cross mapping. With longer time series, the reconstructed manifolds are denser, nearest neighbors are closer, and the cross map estimates increase in precision. We call this phenomenon convergent cross mapping and use this convergence as a practical criterion for detecting causation. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> convergent cross mapping um, uh, involves recovering states of the causal variable from the affected variable. And um, if this is possible, then causal inference is static. So, if x causes y, this means that Y contains information about X that can be used to recover X. Um, here's, a, here's an example to kind of give you more intuition for this. So in, in this coupled system, um, X has a potential effect on Y, but Y has no effect on X. So if alpha is equal to zero... Sorry, could X... you speak a little bit louder or closer to the microphone? Oh, okay. Um, if I get closer to the microphone, then my head gets bigger in the, in the screen. You might not like that. All right. Anyhow, so um, uh, in this coupled system, X has a potential effect on Y, but Y has no effect on X. Um, when alpha, so when alpha is equal to zero, um, neither has an effect on either, right? However, if I now uh, crank up alpha, 
um, I should be able to see the effect of x on y. And this is what you get. Okay. So again, you can see that, that, uh, that x, the blue time series, has not been affected at all, but the, but the, um, the other time series has. And it's that um, the information that's now deposited into the red time series will, should allow me to recover the values of x. So a necessary condition is that the cross map estimate, so I'm using the, the red time series to predict the blue one. Um, uh, a necessary condition is that the cross map estimate should um, improve with time series length. So as um, nearby points get closer, so as you have more data, the attractor that you reconstruct is denser. And so the nearby points are closer, which means that your nearest neighbor estimates are better, right? So, so sort of obvious. Um, all right, uh, this is a classic uh, example. Uh, it's the classic predator-prey experiment that Gauza made famous in the 40s. Uh, Didinium is a, um, is a rotor for predator, and paramecium is the prey. So if you do, if you do, um, so this, it's basically a predator-prey example. And if you do cross mapping in either directions, then you can clearly see that there's bidirectional causation here. So, um, red is the effect of the predator on the prey, and blue is the effect of the prey on the predator. So again, this is showing convergence. I'm, I'm looking at larger library sizes, which basically, this is, um, I'm looking as, with increasing library size, it's like looking at, at a denser and denser attractor. So my predictions get better, right, uh, until, until they kind of asymptote here. So what, what's interesting is that what we're looking at here is a causal effect with no time lags. Um, you know, in reality, however, you would expect um, that the effect of the predator on the prey, I mean, that can, ha can happen with no time lag. Because wh what happens? It, the predator eats the prey. So it's like instantaneous, death, instantaneous. However, the effect of the prey on the predator is not instantaneous, right? So the predator eats the prey, and it takes a while for that prey to translate into predator growth. And so uh, you would not expect an instantaneous effect in the other direction. So even though there's, there's, uh, you're going to have a bidirectional effect, in one, di one direction is going to happen quickly, and the other direction is going to happen slowly. And so you should be able to see that if you, do, um, if, if you look at the time lags, which is what we do here. So again, we're looking at the prediction lag, and we find that the effect of the predator on the prey is essentially instantaneous. But the effect of the prey on the predator um, happens with some, some kind of a time lag. So the time lag, these are measured in units of half days. So the time lag is actually two days. It takes two days for a prey, after a prey has been eaten, for that benefit to translate into growth uh, of the predator. Right? So um, gives you interesting insight into the mechanism. Um, this is a field example. That was just an, that was an experiment. Um, Experiments tend to be easy. Um, field examples tend to be hard. So sardines and anchovies show reciprocal abundance patterns in the 20th century, which is suggestive of competition. I mean, you think of a sardine and an anchovy, they're about the same size, they're eating kind of the same sorts of things. Um, and uh, if you look <clears throat> at uh, many parts of the world, um, you know, Peru, uh, Japan, um, uh, South Africa, um, here in California, you find when sardines are abundant, uh, anchovies are often rare and vice versa. And so the, the general consensus was that these must be competitors, right? However, um, well, if you do cross mapping, uh, this is again for the California sardines, um, which is the panel in the, in the lower left, um, we don't find any evidence that, that one is affecting the other. We don't find any evidence of interaction. So sardines are not affecting, there's no cross-mapping here between, there's no information shared between sardines and anchovies. However, if you, if you look at sea surface temperature and you, from the sardine time series, you find that you can actually recover estimates of past sea surface temperatures from the sardine time series and also from the, from the anchovy time series. So it means that 
although these things are not interacting with each other, they are both being affected by a third agent um, in, in, a, in a fairly complex, in a fairly complex and in different ways. So um, uh, this, this is a, um, uh, so I mean, the, the, the insight that comes out of this is that um, the reciprocal abundance patterns may in fact not be due to, to an interaction but may be due to common forcing by an environmental uh, effect. Okay. Um, this is the example that, that, uh, that I mentioned in the answer to, to that, uh, to the question earlier. Um, and um, uh, uh, so e episodic red tides around scripts, um, I think are a classic example of something that no one, no one has been able to predict. It's a little embarrassing because you know Scripps is this big oceanographic, you know, prestigious oceanographic institution, and uh, these red tides are like one of the most conspicuous features that you see outside the window. Um, but no one's really been able to explain them. Uh, they've been thought to be regime-like, um, but again, this uh, mechanism for the rapid transition, the, these blooms of um, a rapid transition of state, has remained a uh, mystery for over a century. So this is true despite um, a half a dozen or so Scripps PhD theses showing in principle and by experiment that environmental drivers should be important. So, um, however, when you look at the field observations, there are no obvious correlations. And so this, this is why, why, um, why we haven't made much progress on this problem. So there's, there are no obvious correlations between <coughs> environmental variables and chlorophyll A. So uh, again, this was the case that we saw with the temperature anomaly that we saw that that, uh, that I showed you earlier. Um, this is again the, the green are, are peaks in chlorophyll, which correspond to the red tides, and the blue are these surface temperature anomalies, which um, you know were correlated for a while, but then that correlation disappeared. So the the absence of environmental correlations suggests that the events that these events cannot be described by linear dynamics. And, and this is confirmed by an SMAP test for nonlinearity. Um, and by significant predictability found with nonlinear forecasting use, using simplex projection. So um, uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have a cursor that, that works on, that you can see. But if you look in the upper right, you find uh, reasonable predictability with an embedding dimension of around four. And, and if you do a, an SMAP test using an embedding of, th of four, and you crank up the nonlinearity, you find indeed um, you do a lot better with a nonlinear model than you do with with, uh, with a, a simple linear model. So this is not just stochastic. This is a, a clear, clearly state-dependent nonlinear event. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that we're actually able to get reasonable predictability um, uh, just doing this really simple univariate. Um, univariate uh, uh, analysis. So we, we, we actually, we get a correlation coefficient of 0.5, which is, which is not, not too bad, not too shabby, given the fact that um, this was thought to be completely unpredictable, all right? So um, the, the curious thing though is, uh, if you examine just the bloom days, and there are only, so in, in the original data set, we had something like 1600 data points. Um, in this data set, we have 169 of, of just the bloom days. And you do and you do univariate simplex on just the bloom days, the, the forecasts are not nearly as predictable uh, as, as skillful. So you get a correlation not a, not a, not close to 0.5, but about close to 0.3 instead. So this again suggests that stochastic external forces may be important during blooms. So when you do a univariate embedding, you're really only uncovering things that are um, uh, information about things that are um, sort of intrinsic to the dynamics. Um, and so what this, is, what this result is suggesting is that there may be these external forces that are important uh, during blooms. And so to make a good prediction, we have to explicitly include these drivers. Okay, so the candidate variables that we looked at, um, this was actually a, a class project um, that, uh, that ended up taking about uh, two and a half years <laughs> to finish. But uh, um, the, the candidate var variables fell into the two loose categories. Stories, uh, variables that summarize the nutrient history and uh, variables related to stratification and mixing. So again, if you look with cross-correlation, <coughs> there's very little suggestion of environmental forcing. However, when you look with CCM, 
you can see most of the suspected variables do in fact show causal influence in the time series data from the field observations. So um, therefore, if, if we were to include these variables as coordinate axes and make a multivariate um, native state space embedding, we should be able to, to get some good, good predictability. So um, unfortunately, what we had, so the, the, this is an analysis that, um, um, that was based on, on data that were collected by McGowan. And he had the field samples analyzed up to 2010 at the time. And so all the data that we used for, the, for all of this analysis that you've seen so far is based on data up to 2010. And what we really needed was a, a good out of sample test. And so he, although he had, he had collected the samples, he had not fully analyzed, uh, the, uh, analyzed them. And um, so he, he then extracted the data for, for, the, uh, for the years um, 2010 to 2012. And we then used that as out of, uh, our out of sample test to see how well um, our models were doing. So again, um, when you do the, when you do the univariate embedding, you find a, a, a peak at around an embedding dimension of four. And so uh, what we ended up doing is, oops, sorry. So what we ended up doing is um, constructing models that were, um, we tried a two-dimensional model, a three-dimensional model, and a four-dimensional model. Um, and we selected this model in advance of actually having had the data. So every, everyone, so after having spent nearly a year and a half on this, um, we, 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 uh, um, we now had the, the, the new current data that hadn't been seen before in hand. And uh, there were eight of us all together. And so you know, we had, we had uh, you know, basically 32 crossed fingers hoping that this would work. And uh, this is what we got. So uh, again, this is a true, true out of sample forecasting um, and this is using, in this case, the four-dimensional model. And so um, we were able to, to, to pr pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well forecast um, these, these boom events. So um, again, the, the model uh, get, contained variables that, were, that had to do with, um, the four-dimensional model had variables that had to do both with nutrient history as, as well as water stratification. So you, you need the interplay of these two things to, to get a, a good picture. All right, so again, these are just four variables. So the, we're not, you know, this is not a, a very a highly parameterized model um, in any way. So, all right. Um, uh, so <clears throat> I wanna discuss this, which I think is potentially the most exciting application of these ideas. And again, this is work that's being done by the Verma Lab at the Salk Institute. Um, and, and the way the, uh, the, the way that they can get these time series is basically by synchronizing and resampling. Um, um, uh, for every 30 minutes for two days. So you have to uh, be willing to, to not sleep or to, to, to basically do, do this in shifts. So they're interrogating thousands of genes every 30 minutes. Um, and uh, this is the attractor that we saw earlier built by combining cell cycle genes, sweep four, clean three, and clean two. So, and again, all the, though these are mutually uncorrelated, um, um, we need to include these because CCM showed that they were causally linked. Um, okay, so what we want to see, so what, what, what I really found intriguing about this particular study uh, with regard to, to CCM and these methods is that um, the experiments um, actually, because you could do experiments, you could then test, you can then validate whether the, the causal link that you found, that you suspected, or that you predicted by looking at, by doing a CCM analysis, um, can actually show up when you do an experiment. So um, the, the cap capability of verifying whether the CCM links were real um, uh, could, be, could be verified by experiment, which, which made this, um, this kind of a problem um, really, really attractive. So here's an example showing the uncorrelated linkage between SWE4 SWE and, and WE5. Um, they're uncorrelated. So we five is a cell cycle regulator. And, and um, so if you look, uh, again, I don't have a pointer. If you're looking at the box in the upper left, so panel A, the, there's no cor linear correlation between C4 and V5. And if you look at the time series here of V5 and C4 uh, in panel B, you can see that 
um, uh, they're not, uh, there's, it's, it's obvious that there, there should be no correlation and it's not just a matter of things needing to be time shifted. Um, if you look at panel C, um, you can, this is uh, an illustration of uh, cross mapping. So what I'm going to do is from 3, 4, I want to see if there was a causal effect of we 5 on 3, 4. That, that's the idea. And <clears throat> the experiment then would be to take we 5 and um, in this experiment, what they did is um, they did an augmentation of concentration of we 5 so It's called um, uh, 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 a we 5 over expression experiment. They so they put vast amounts of we 5 in, um, in, in into the treatment to see if that then changed the dynamics of SWE4. And um, so in, in principle, by doing the CCM analysis, we would expect there to be an effect, but now we can do an experiment, and this is what you get. Um, if you, uh, we identified the, uh, um, in fact, um, over, over all, overall, 223 genes that were uncorrelated with E5, but the CCM shows are causally linked to E5. And we have performed this we 5 over expression experiment to see if their dynamics were altered. And in B and C, what we see is that um, uh, is, is what we see just for the, the three genes that we looked at earlier. Um, and so the, 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 the black, black line indicates the, the wild type attractor, and the, dash, the, the dotted purple line indicates what you get after experimental manipulation. And the way that you can verify whether this deformation is the, something called co-prediction, where you, you build an attractor on the wild type and you use it to predict an out of sample wild type attractor. And then you build the attractor, uh, and then, then you use that same attractor to try to predict the, the manipulation. And if you see a difference, then you know that the manipulation in your ability to predict, if you see a difference in the ability to predict, and that means the you're basically measuring the experimental effect of the, of the, manip of the, manip of the, manip of the manipulation. All right, um, so, um, uh, so we, we repeated this procedure for all of the 323 genes that show low correlation with V5, but the CCM indicates are strongly causally linked to V5, and strikingly, 80% um, or so um, uh, that were predicted to be causally linked to V5 were in fact verified to be causally experimental, so, which, is, which is pretty good. So, the fact that CCM can identify these things with an accuracy of, of around and be right about 80% of the time is, is pretty remarkable. So the, the, the current, so the industry standard um, is something called DREAM5, and this only had, has a 3% success rate. So um, you, you, you do a lot better thinking of gene expression as a dynamic process than you do um, uh, you know, with the current bioinformatics paradigm, which, which is based on statics, on, on you know, just statistical correlation between genes. So uh, what's interesting here about these, th th this study really focused on things, uh, on genes that we knew to be um, statistically uncorrelated. What's interesting about these uncorrelated genes um, from a biological standpoint is that these probably represent signal integrators, which are, or check, uh, which are very important um, um, in terms of checkpoints which is something extremely important for, for cancer research right now. So um, uh, the idea is that uh, the CCM might, might, might have a lot of really good potential application to, uh, uh, to cancer research or to the study of, of checkpoint inhib inhibitors um, because it'll expose those. So all these checkpoints are generally invisible to current bioinformatics approaches because they're not co they, don't, they, they show things that are uncorrelated with each other. But if you, if clearly, if you do if you do this dynamic analysis, you can find um, you can find they're correlated. So being able to, to create a, a network of gene of potential gene interactions is is incredibly valuable because it it, it would really increase the, the speed of workflow. Um, uh, experiments are currently done kind of idiosyncratically in, in genomics. Um, people choose a set of genes that they've just been working on forever, and um, uh, they, uh, they, they kind of hope that these are important ones. But, and, and, but if we had a good way, this is really the motivation for doing bio, bioinformatics. If we, if we had a good way of um, identifying which interactions or which sets of genes are going to be important, then, then we're, we're, we're miles ahead of the game.
And so um, if, if using sort of a dynamic and nonlinear approach to, to looking at a gene expression can give us that kind of a map, um, then, then um, uh, I, I think this has you know, enormous potential value. So you can see why, why I'm kind of excited about this one. Again, I, I'm not the one doing the work. Um, it's being done by, by um, Indiverma's lab up, up the hill. And Ger Gerald Powell is one of the, the principal people doing it. All right. Um, so to, to demonstrate a mammalian example, we zoomed in on this, this well-studied, this is a very well-studied set of genes. This is a little idiosyncratic set um, that were of special interest to, to the Verma lab. Um, um, so interestingly, if you do cross-correlation um, to, to establish what the network might, might be, um, you get an entirely wrong network. So the one on the left, the network on the left, um, um, is, is completely incorrect. Whereas if you, if you use CCM, um, you get something that looks a little bit more reasonable. And in particular, it gets uh, that, that green link between rel A and I kappa B alpha, which are, um, uh, is, is known to be, a, which is a, a well-known sort of uh, bidirectional feedback. And in fact, it shows that it's bidirectional here. And um, that it generates uh, something um, that looks limit cycle light. This has been observed, actually, that there's kind of limit cycle-like behavior between I kappa B alpha and rel A. Um, what was not known, however, is uh, how June fit into all of this. Um, but CCM said that June is going to be important. And so, in fact, if you, if you look now at the phase portraits of these things, um, so the, the first phase portrait on the left is the known causal link that we were able to ver verify with CCM between rel A and a kappa B alpha. And uh, the next one is the, uh, was the previously unknown but predicted causal link found by CCM. And you can see that it also uh, exhibits sort of limit cycle-like, but, but not really limit cycle, but limit cycle-like behavior. Okay, so um, this is an interesting, another interesting example. And this is a, a mouse example, not, not, not just these. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through a, um, a quick sampling of assorted recent studies. Um, this, uh, this study uh, looked at um, the increase in, in cosmic ray incidents in the 20th century, uh, which has been used to suggest that uh, the observed climate warming is, is natural and not due to man. So this, this study used CCM to examine this potential effect, and it found it found uh, no evidence for cosmic rays causing the 20th century warming trend. But it did, what was interesting is that it found an effect on an interannual time scale. So in other words, if you first difference the data and you did CCM on, on the data, um, you, you found an effect. So, which resonated actually with, with experiments. Well, you can show experiment, experimentally that Cosmic rays through through you know, nucleating cloud formation should should affect um, uh, temperatures, but um, we were able to show by first differencing that cosmic rays actually do have a year to year the year to year variations in cosmic rays do have an effect on temperature, but that if you look at the total 20th century tre trend, um, uh, you you find no measurable um, influence of cosmic rays on on, on global temperature. All right, so. Uh, <coughs> This study involved the analysis of the uh, Bostock ice core time series data to see if there's a direct observational evidence for causal effects. Uh, and we were able to confirm by direct observation, so the well-established mechanism for greenhouse gases, um, that CO2 and, and, and methane affect temperature and that that effect is pretty much an immediate effect. But the other thing that, that we were able to, to that, this, that this examination was able to confirm is um, the controversial link um, to temperature from, um, I'm sorry, to greenhouse gases from temperature. So, but that, that uh, so there is a causal effect, sort of a positive feedback, but that, that particular link was quite delayed. So on the order of hundreds of years. So higher temperatures do affect greenhouse gases, but in a delayed way, on, uh, on, on, uh, on the delayed, it's on the order of hundreds of years. All right. So, um, and then this one focused on forecasting that was aimed um, at better, at producing better production forecasts for Canada's uh, uh, iconic stock ice salmon industry. And uh, you know, basically we were able to show that um, 
that these uh, that models that included some unvar environmental variables were, were able to produce good forecasts. It was interesting because <clears throat> we we produced forecasts based on uh, 2012 data about what was what the what the returns were going to be in 2012, and uh, I'm sorry, in 20, um, 2014, and um, um, the Canadian so uh, Canadians are very concerned about salmon, um, uh, Fraser River salmon, and salmon. It's, it's like their, one of their national iconic fisheries. And um, the uh, national newspaper, Globe and Mail, um, got wind of our forecast, and they, they saw that the, our forecast was actually pretty good, and way, way better than the official one that was put out by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the FO in Canada. And um, so uh, there was some publicity about that. Uh, which led us to, to make another forecast um, uh, for, for the following following next years, um, and each of these actually turned out to be um, uh, quite a lot better than the forecasts that were produced by, by the DFO model. So again, the DFO models are more or less assuming um, something called maximum sustainable yield, which assumes the, the system is is in equilibrium, and uh, that's an assumption that simply is not borne out if you make observations. Um, all right. So um, uh, this is an application of these methods to understand environmental drivers of flu epidemics. And what, what was interesting about this study is that uh, it used something called, that we, we call scenario exploration, which is um, essentially you make a model, um, an explicit model with temperatures, at, for example, or with, with um, absolute humidity, uh, in this case, being one of the coordinate axes, and you, you say, what would have happened at this point if absolute humidity was higher or if absolute humidity was lower? And so you can basically create these what-if scenarios. Um, and when you do this on, on the Global Flu database, you find um, this allowed us to find a, a temperature threshold at 75 degrees, below which absolute humidity reduces flu transmission and above which it increases flu transmission. So, so most studies of flu have been done in the, in the temperate region, in, you know, where, where temperatures below 75 are common. And, and, it's, and it's fairly well known that high humidity, high humidities there actually tend to inhibit flu transmission. However, if you look in more tropical regions where you get outbreaks above 75, it, has the opposite, it actually has the opposite effect. And that was, that was not known. And so, um, um, you know, discovering the threshold at seventy-five degrees was 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 interesting. And again, it comes it comes from thinking about these thinking about flu dynamics as actually dynamics coming out of, uh, of an attractor of some kind, and and then um, uh, finding uh, uh, developing these analytical methods that allows you to uh, uh, to to back out some of the mechanism that's involved, some of the interesting mechanism. So there there are lots of other factors, of course, but. Absolute humidity is certainly one of them. Uh, and in fact, when you talk about absolute humidity being causal, probably the more proximate causal driver is, would be the relative humidity. But relative humidity is going to be different inside, in most, you know, indoors than it is outdoors. It's highly sensitive to temperature. And so um, um, uh, you, you know, we, we were not able to find much of a relationship to relative humidity. Although if you did the experiment, and you, and you held temperature constant, relative humidity would probably be the more rel relative, relative humidity would probably be the more relevant variable. All right. So um, uh, this, this one actually, this is a study by Satahiro Tajima, uh, who actually unfortunately passed away this last summer, but he won the, the, the 2016 William James Prize for the, the best paper in neuroscience in 2016. And he basically used uh, these empirical dynamic methods to, to show how um, uh, uh, you could use this to, 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 map, to, to map brain states, basically. Right. Um, there's a lot of interest in neuroscience in, in applying these methods. Right. Um, so finally, I want to uh, um, discuss this, this last piece, which I think uh, is kind of interesting. It's a really simple idea. It's an extension of Taken's theorem um, that tries to exploit Taken's theorem further. And um, uh, uh, the idea, <clears throat> so to give you a little background, so in most areas of natural science, 
um, complexity is regarded as a problem. It's an obstacle to be overcome. Systems with many independent variables require exponentially more data to model, with errors growing from the increasing number of parameters that need to be estimated. So this is, this is probably true of, uh, for example, that hydrology model for the Oklahoma River. So each of these variables that you have to estimate has operational noise, and you add them together, and particularly into a functional form that's probably not correct, um, you end up with, with garbage. So the idea here is to exploit the fact, um, using Taken's theorem, that, um, that participating or interacting variables ha have unique information about the whole system. And, it, uh, and then to, exp to combine these, um, uh, uh, these views of so, sort of kaleidoscopically to get a more accurate picture of the system. So you can think of each embedding as filtering this information in a different way. And the idea then is to combine these multiple models, these multiple viewpoints um, to, to get a much, to get a, a, a more complete, a more accurate view of the system. Again, this is a consequence of taking step. So, um, Gosh, I didn't include the slides that, that, uh, that follow up this idea, but <clears throat> when you apply this in a forecasting context, you, you find that, that the uh, forecasts um, uh, it can improve tremendously. So it's, it really, it's, um, it's a quite useful idea that basically takes the phenomenon of um, 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 a cursive dimensionality and, and turns it into an asset. So the fact that, that we have, the, the fact that you're studying a system that's highly interconnected is actually a great advantage. It, it, it provides an opportunity for, for leveraging that information. And that's described in, this, in the science paper, which is fairly short and it's included in the reading list that you have. There. So um, I think I've, I've gone on longer than I anticipated. And uh, I make my, my, my closing, closing remark here is that there's a disconnect here between the interactions that we observe and the, and the reductionist assumptions or the framework that we usually use to study them. So the re reductionism is, is consistent with the idea of, of, of things not being state dependent, of, of, uh, of reasonably being able to study a system by looking at separated pieces. All right, so um, I, th I think I'm not gonna go on too much here. It just goes on and on here, but um, the, again, what I, what I see as um, 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 a transition in science as, as we go into the 21st century is um, that's being enabled by data science is uh, the, first of all, the ability to make many more observations. And secondly, the, the challenge that data science is giving us to, to, uh, to, to have to make better, ob to have to make better predictions. So um, if, if, you, if we're recording more data that allows us to look back and, and find out how well our predictions actually are doing, um, I, th I think we're more likely to, to, to use that as a, as a, as a standard uh, a test of validation. So um, what, what I've tried to suggest is, um, is that, that um, there is some value to, um, to looking at systems more holistically. And, and in fact, um, these EDM tools are really simple um, simple sort of almost zero to order tools that, that um, um, allow you to begin to do that. And, and I, I really think that we're just scratching the surface. I think we're, um, uh, th there's a lot more that can be done um, um, with EDM. I, you know, I think one of, the, one of the, the outstanding problems, for example, would be how do you, how do you turn, how do you, how do you turn um, an, uh, a ma an attractor that you generate from data into um, uh, some reasonable set of equations? And so uh, that's, that's kind of an open problem that, that, I, that I think uh, would, be, would be interesting to, to follow up on. So um, um, I, I included this, this little commentary in the readings too. Um, this was a, a commentary done by Don DeAngelis, who's, who's a, a quite uh, um, uh, well-known um, theoretical ecologist. Um, and he, he was a, a plasma physicist as well. Um, whose career is basically based on, on using these simple equations. And, and I thought it was quite um, um, generous of him to, to, to make this comment um, that, um, uh, that doing this kind of empirically based modeling might be, um, um, might be interesting and valuable going forward. So again, 
data science makes this all possible. So data driven discovery is, is the way to go. VM is just one of the tools. So uh, these are my tasteless thematic closing slides. Um, uh, so the idea again is that it's, it's, uh, you, you can make very good theoretical arguments, but in, in the end, um, I tend to believe experiment um, uh, uh, more than anything else. Uh, and, I, and I think the gene expression um, work is an example of being able to do this experimentally. So um, this is actually with particular reference to fisheries models that are built on, on assumptions of equilibrium. And, um, and, and again, um, um, that's, I should put that back a little bit. I, I hope I'm not offending anyone. Um, and so this is certainly true. All right. So um, I make a few acknowledgments uh, to my funding agencies, um, um, NSF, um, 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 uh, NSF, uh, two different directors at NSF actually, the director of, of bioinformatics and uh, uh, um, division of environmental biology, and also the Department of Defense uh, CERTA program, Lenford's Pew Foundation, McQuan Chair, graduate fellowships, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the lab. These are the people who actually did the work that I talked about, and uh, thank you. So I'm ready for questions. More questions? Hello, sorry, uh, just a more technical question. Uh, I noticed that uh, filtering is rarely used in your uh, results on your data, right? Filtering data. No, actually, no. Um, we don't filter the data. In fact, in general, I, I think it's best not to filter data. Um, I mean, for example, taking log transforms can, can really um, uh, can obliterate um, an important signal if the, if the largest changes are the things that are interesting. Um, so I would, I would tend to um, so one of the problems is, uh, so this, this is sort of a general issue that I have with, with, um, with filtered data. So in, in, um, in meteorology, for example, there's something called analyzed data. And what that is, is uh, the basic observations then filtered through a, a model. And, uh, and then those observations, quote unquote, are corrected according to, 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 to better fit the model. And um, I find that kind of thing a little bit dangerous. The same thing happens in fisheries. We have um, data that, are, that come out of stock assessments. And the stock assessment data, again, are data, are not the raw data, but data that, are, that have been filtered uh, through, through models that, in fact, we know are incorrect. Um, and so um, I, I think in some cases, um, the filtering, um, can take an, uh, um, an interesting piece of data, maybe that's nonlinear and that has that has some interesting sort of mid direction, mid dimensional signal, and um, and and remove that that interesting information. So, for example, if you try to filter uh, by taking a moving average, you might take a something that's nonlinear and turn it into something that looks more or less linear. Um, and um, so, I would. Uh, I think there are occasions when filtering does make sense, but in general, but 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 more often than not, it's it, it, it's something to be that I think uh, needs to be should be avoided. So raw raw, raw data is really essential. Hi, uh, I was wondering in the the gene expression example, mm -hmm. in these cases you usually have a very large number of pairs of things that you're looking at, do you run into problems of multiple comparisons or do you have to control for that in some way, like a spurious relations between this large number of pairs? Yeah, so the gene expression, so in yeast, for example, there are what, we're talking on the order of 25,000 genes, right? And so 25,000 choose two is a big number. 
Um, and, um, and so there, I mean, there is the, there is that, um, uh, the fact that you have so many possible pairs suggests that you know, probably some fraction of them are not going to be, are going to be, you know, that you find to, to be um, causal are going to be spurious. Um, but um, um, I, mean, I think that's something that, 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 that we can live with, you know, especially since the, the current state of the art is, is, is a, a level of accuracy that's on the order, that's in single di digits, you know, but basically 3% of the things that we, that we thought were, were links using correlation actually turn out to be links. So, um, um, uh, you know, I, I look at the fact that, that gene expression has so much data as, as a great opportunity. Um, the fact that, that you're dealing with this, this highly complicated interconnected system means that, that there, I mean, that gives you many more ways of looking at the system. So you can kind of think of each of these genes as another observation um, of what's going on in, in the other genes. And um, so I just think the potential for information leverage is, is really high. And I mean, that fact, that nobody has tried to exploit that fact, fact yet. I mean, this whole idea of, of looking at gene expression is uh, totally new. I mean, we're talking about, in this case, a, a paper that has not yet even been submitted that, that's, that, that, that we're about to put in, you know, we're about to try to put out there. Um, it's done, it just has to be put out there. So, um, uh, you know, I, I look at the, I look at the, at the, the large number of possible interactions and the large number of genes as an opportunity as opposed to something, something to, to worry about. But you're absolutely right that, that when you have a large number of interactions, there, there are going to be a certain number, there's going to be a lot, there are also going to be a large number of things that if you use CCM, you're going to identify incorrectly. But that, that's just, uh, that's just the way it is. Okay. I have a question because I, it's, it's obvious the potential of this uh, SMAP and, and all these methods, equation-free equation methods. But I, I mean, how does this method behave in a, in a critical transition or a, or a critical or a large transition in the ecosystem, a huge collapse? They can not anticipate them before they happen because they, they didn't happen and the, that... Uh, part of the phase space is not even explored. So mm -hmm. in order to create or give management uh, advice, you need to anticipate that if you increase fishery pressure, you will have this collapse. And, and this method, I, I cannot see how can they get that advices to managers or, or people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so one way that you can do that is if you are, for example, look at the, the SMAP procedure. Um, if you are, um, um, what you could do, I mean, one possibility would be to compute a local Lyapunov exponent wherever you are. And if that local Lyapunov exponent um, uh, um, shows that you're about to enter a, a part or, or a region where there's going to be a lot of divergence, then, then I mean, that would be information that could actually be used for early warning. I mean, so I, I have been involved in, in a number of these papers on early warning signs, um, and most of them are are based on um, sort of uh, uh, um, kind of heuristic rules of thumb for what, what you would expect of a system as it's moving from a stable state to an unstable state. Um, so for example, you'd find positive autocorrelation between, stronger you know, positive autocorrelation between observations. You might find larger swings in variance, um, th uh, things like that. Uh, but um, um, I think that, that it, it should be possible to, again, you're looking at the live data. You're not just looking historically, but you're looking at the live data. If you, if there's some way to compute a, a lo local Lyapunov exponent, that uh, that is probably going to be a, a better indicator of um, uh, of a uh, of a big uh, of an impending swing. So, um, but um, 
uh, the, you know, as far as like looking at historic regime shifts, there are lots of examples of, of so-called historic regime shifts. And um, uh, one of the questions that one might ask is <coughs> whether, so in ecology, um, are these really regime shifts? Is it, is it really, um, uh, are you moving really from one state into, into another state? Are, they, are these states really um, uh, different in any quantifiable way? And so, I mean, you can say, well, look, the species look different, but what, what's really, what you're really interested in is if the functioning of the system, say, in one state, is different from the functioning of the system in another state. And <clears throat> here, this is a case where you could divide the data up into what you suspect these different states are, and then you can use CCM to find out what are the important, what are the important interactions? Are they different in one state than they are in another, in another state? And so it's a way of actually being able to quantify something that's quite fuzzy right now. Hello. Uh, since that your method is quite sensitive to a characteristic time of the time series used to reconstruct the data, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. the typical time you use to the tau or theta, I don't remember. Uh, you yeah. reconstruct the data. Mm -hmm. How sensitive the method is to this parameter? And second, if the, the system changed the parameter along the time, can I use this characteristic to the... I, I'm thinking about the, the, the brain and the, the, the waves in the brain, that they yeah. don't have a typical frequency, that they change a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I use this change yeah. to reconstruct with a different characteristic time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, the, if, you, if you look at the, uh, these papers by Tajima, um, he, does, um, he uses um, essentially random embeddings. So choosing multiple tau's, multiple lags, and, and, and multiple embedding dimensions to, to try to to try to attack that that problem, and um, has had some success. I, I I would I suggest taking a look at what what he had done specifically to, to look at, at the problem that you mentioned. So again, you know, in 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 the um, applications that that I that I have um, worked on, it's um, uh, uh, so in environmental science, we oversampling is not a problem. Um, we typically have many more ob um, uh, many. We typically have fewer observations than, than we really should be be, be obtaining. Now, a typical ecological survey goes out maybe once a year, um, and so the, the story that we get is very stro is very um, uh, incomplete. I think it's like looking for a strobe at uh, at uh, at a movie, and um, we uh, but. Um, uh, and, and, and so for and so the, the practical experience for looking at those kinds of data is um, we almost always end up using a tau of one. And so tau that, that tau is, is not a is not an adjustable parameter. But for, for something like um, um, uh, um, uh, studying the brain, um, I think oversampling you can you can get oversampling. I, I think there you have the luxury of, of being able to, to measure things pretty pretty continuously. And, um, and 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 what you're mentioning actually could 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 be an issue. And and, uh, and so this is this is something that that uh, Tajima discusses a little bit in his papers. I suggest you look at that. Okay, so we have another seminar still today, George. So. Thanks very much for, for all your time. And um, I think we'll have also have exercise sessions based on what he's doing. So, so let's give a hand to, to George again. For Thank you. Thank you very much, George.